Hi everyone, I'm Nikita from Blue Rock. Welcome to today's webinar. We're going to start in a few minutes. We're just going to let everyone join the room first. Everyone coming in there. More, good yeah. afternoon, Michael. Afternoon. Hey, Bruce, how are you? Yeah, good. Um, Welcome to uh, everyone as you join in. We'll get started in a sec. Uh, welcome to people that aren't in lockdown that are allowed out of their houses at the moment. So uh, the rest of us in uh, sunny Melbourne, um, we're trapped again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this was an event that we were hoping to run um, as a face-to-face -face event um, to, to, uh, to see people as well as a virtual event. So Unfortunately, we weren't able to do that. We've got a couple more people joining, so we're just about get ready, get started. And then we've got people that are not even in the country, Mandy, so welcome. Thank you. Um, and for, yeah, for as many of you as possible, we've turned the cameras on. We'd love it to be interactive. So if, you, if you're not eating your lunch or doing something like that, turn the cameras on because I'm going to throw you a question to you. You know, Chris, I'm going to ask you a question anyway. So you may as well have your cameras on. <laughs> on. Um, uh, technology, uh, technically challenged at the moment. Bruce, I think I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to reboot and come back in in one second. No worries. <laughs> Meaning I'm going to put on some clothes. Yeah. <laughs> Radio. So I was going to suggest one of the kids was going to be there to help him turn it on. Yeah. <laughs> so Chris is in yeah. Queensland, so he's not in lockdown. So he's, uh, you know, like you, Jason, it's all good, sunny Queensland. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Bruce McFarlane. I'm, I'm the CEO of Blue Rock, um, and I'm also one of the founders of BDC Partners. Um, for those of you who haven't been part of our um, webinar series before or attended our events, um, Blue Rock, we're an entrepreneurial advisory firm. So what that means is we've got a professional services part of our business. So we do legal, accounting, wealth, finance, and a number of other professional services um, uh, avenues. But we also have an investment part of our business. So we, we co-own and co-operate a number of businesses, including businesses in uh, hospitality and retail. Um, and then BDC, who we're... Um, partnering with who's running the event today. So BDC is uh, franchisors that solve problems for other franchisors and retailers. Um, and so we've got one of the co-founders, David, who, uh, David, I think we, we were dressed from the same people today. So that was great. Welcome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so today's session, I'll, I'll introduce the other panel men members in a second, but today's session is really about, you know, franchising and one, demonstrating how resilient franchising has been, particularly during COVID. And there's lots of trends in franchising around buying local and, you know, people moving to regional areas and, and see changes and, and also embracing entrepreneurship. And, and so today's really about the positive aspects of franchising and the life cycle of the franchisee and how when they enter the system and how we can help them as franchisors on their journey through the system, through induction, um, into you know benchmarking and ensure that their performance is great and through to exit you know and how can we ensure that they they can make money out of their investment and they return a great and so they they become advocates of your system um, even though they've exited so we've brought a, a panel together um, to talk about all the different aspects of this life cycle of a franchisee today so David who I mentioned so David is um, a former award-winning franchisor himself with salts of the earth he, he set up a franchise system for Hames paints and he's um you know just recovering from going to the rugby I, I, you know and been locked in isolation for 14 days because of his you know hanging out with people from sydney at the rugby so welcome david yeah thanks bruce thanks for that i knew you and i don't have red eyes because i have covid it's because my son was up all night with asthma so uh, <laughs> no need to, no need to worry guys um and now uh our next panel member, it's Tanya Robinson. So welcome, Tanya. So Tanya is a new member of the, uh, the BDC team heading up our franchise development part. But Tanya has been involved in franchising for a number of years um, in, with 7-Eleven, Sigma, even smaller systems like Brazilian Butterfly. So seen from, from smaller systems through to some of the largest ones in the country. Um, Tanya's 
um, enjoying lockdown and, and, and really happy that you won't be able to go to the footy this year because now that Richmond's not going to make the finals. Um, Oi. She's, just, <laughs> she's, uh, she's happy about being locked in her house. So welcome, Tanya. <laughs> Thanks, Bruce. <laughs> um, I'm like so a true Geelong supporter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> our next panel member, so Cameron Prosser. So Cameron is the general manager of BF Brokers. Um, Cameron is uh, looking forward to the Olympics as well as, you know, being an elite swimmer, seeing whether or not we're going to win as more gold medals than ever before. He also was in Melbourne but escaped to Sydney because he was laughing at about all the lockdowns we'd had and now he's locked down himself. So, Cameron, that's come back to bite you too, hasn't it? It did, mate, it did. Not the greatest move by us, but uh, we'll make the most of it. <laughs> um, and our fourth panel member, Aaron March, is one of the directors in our accounting firm. He, he spends lots of time... Uh, you know, looking at spreadsheets and numbers. So being locked at home is probably, you know, lucky for him. Um, he's, Aaron's warned us that his wife is just about to give birth to their second child. So if he disappears off the screen, we know that he's just had to bolt out and uh, rush to the hospital. So welcome, Aaron. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to get, some, get to spend some time with you this afternoon. So looking forward to this. And hopefully you make it through the whole hour before you have to race <laughs> off. So. Not, not just an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so just a little bit of logistics. So we are recording the session, as Nikita said earlier. So we've got people that weren't able to join us today that would like to watch later on. But um, and we and as I mentioned to Chris earlier, now he's worked his camera out. We we want it to be interactive as possible. You know, we've got some great expertise on our panel, but we've got some amazing expertise with all the participants today. So feel free to ask questions or um, throw them in the chat if you'd like, and I can ask them on the way through, or just you know wave at me and I'll uh, hopefully get your attention. We'll go questions on the way through. So, um, but off off we go. So we're going to start with franchise recruitment. Um, so, Dave, as you know, as starting the recruitment process, what do you recommend that franchisors do to, to make the, sure that the process as, is as efficient and robust as possible? Yeah, it, there's, there's, there's nothing quite like a time that kills deals fairly quickly when it comes to franchise recruitment. So it's very important that you have, a, I suppose, a predetermined recruitment process in place that's got all the touch points that, that's needed, that's going to capture the data that you want. So firstly, before you, st you set out, probably one of the key things is, is to define, are you selling a territory before you have a site on it? What does it all look like? Because if you're just selling a territory, you need to understand the, the different ranges of the investment for that. But if you have an actual site, you've got so something tangible to sell. Um, the next part of the process is really understand the audience. What sort of a person are you selling to? Who are you trying to recruit into the, into the business? What's their wants? What's their pain points? Um, are they doing a career change? Because that can typically assist with regards to uh, coaching them through the, the, rec the recruitment process. Um, the next part is make sure that you have a, like a, well, a, well, a, a fairly smoothly run CRM that has preemptive, these, all these preemptive steps mapped out. Um, all of your templates ready to go. So whether it's an application form that has all of the information you want to capture, uh, cash flowing templates, business plans, all of that. So it's really just done at, a, at the push of a button and it's going to save the recruiters time so that they're focused on spending more time on the phones, guiding people through. Um, and I suppose the main, main, main one is make sure you have some form of uh, finance solution in place because as you start progressing the lead and the lead is getting pretty damn serious down and they're down at the bottom of the funnel we want to make sure that we have you know be able to hand off to a broker or to a banker that you're working with so that it really it, it doesn't mean that the prospect has to go out and start looking for it themselves because really they don't know what they have to do do you know what I mean? So if you can guide that, that's going to assist with the smooth, with the, with the efficiency of your recruitment process. Work. And um, so what about, so now you, you're all ready to go. And, and obviously some, we've got some pretty established systems that have got these things in place already, but um, you know, what sort of channels do you, are people finding as the best ones for finding leads for potential franchisees? It's, it's really interesting because, again, it comes down to who is the, who's the avatar, who's the perfect franchisee for your system. Like, do a fair bit of work on understanding the demographics, their interests, their attributes, because there's, 
there's platforms out there such as, you know, the, the typical ones, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, there's Google Display Network, and um, there's, you know, Seek Business, there's Inside Franchise Business, commercial, uh, commercial real estate. So it's, it is, there's a minefield out there, but what you need to do is correctly define who is your ideal candidate, understand the channels of which they consume, the platforms they consume content from, and then make sure I always recommend to people because the Google Display Network is fantastic and it's a very underutilized resource when it comes to franchise recruitment, is that you can actually target competitors. If people are looking at your site, or sorry, if people are looking at competitors' sites, you can remarket to them knowingly that they are shopping around that people are actively looking for businesses. So where, where it kicks off, Bruce, is understand who you're trying to sell to first, and then secondly, make sure that you're putting the content on front of them in the channels that they use. What about you, Michael? What's, what are you finding is the, uh, the best channel at the moment for Boost and other in your brands? Bruce, I, I've got to say, we're, we're in a very fortunate position that uh, we don't have to do too much advertising at all really and it was interesting listening to to bruce uh, sorry to david talking about territories because we're moving more into the uh we're selling it a number more of the mobile um type booths rather than the, the fixed site so it, we're starting to do that and we haven't done too much advertising in that way the, the one thing that we've done is we if anyone follows it there's a instagram account boost juice regional or whatever it is i think and that's like a moving billboard. So he's off to, uh, next one is um, Alice Springs, I think he's heading. And, you know, that, that helps us immensely. So quite different in our uh, ways of marketing, Bruce. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? What about you, Ben? You are... Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, mate. Oh. Um, yeah, sorry about that. At the moment, all of ours has effectively been recruiting from within. Um, yeah. So we're taking sort of, you know, a one restaurant operator to a multi-store operator um, by effectively enabling people within the first restaurant to sort of grow and develop and either take a full or a partial ownership with a new site. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And um, sorry, I just saw a... Um, Thanks for the tip. There's a question from Mandy about finance. So we'll jump back a little bit, David, to your previous comments around relationships with financial institutions. So Mandy, we can see we, we ran a session, um, a webinar in probably September last year where we had the, the key franchise representatives from all the major banks, um, the big four banks in Australia plus Judo Bank. Um, and so that's something that we think is really important for brands to actually have relationships with those key people, um, which makes life a lot easier for when franchisees are trying to find finance. Dave, I'll let you, is there any other? Yeah, and probably one of the key components, what we've found in recruitment just since this financial year is that the banks are now starting to look for what does the deal look like? What does the lease look like? So whether it's a heads of agreement or something, it doesn't have to be a fully drafted lease. They are looking for some form of, you know, letterhead saying, here's what the, here's what the rental amount, the outgoings is. So when they are stress testing your cash flow, the cash flow of the applicant, um, what happens is, is that if they don't have the sensitivity of the business in the cash flow, they can blow out the wages without increasing the revenue and you'll end up with a, a, an application not getting through. So making sure when, when you say your cash flow template and everything is in place, make sure you have a sensitivity uh, chart beside it so they don't start blowing out all of your, all of your OPEX costs. Um, but yeah, it's very important that you, you forge that relationship with the lenders so that they understand how the business performs and they understand, most importantly, those sensitivities of the cash flow. Yeah. And we've, we've got a document when we ran that webinar um, last year, we've got some information that we recommend. So I can send that around again to you, Mandy. Um, so Dave, what about the application process? So, you know, what sort of information do you recommend to make the application process as sort of as efficient as possible? Yeah, so with regards to, I, I always look at how you can save time the whole way through the recruitment process into the lending process as well. 
you're going to be capturing similar data to what the bankers and the lenders are looking for as well. So it's important that you've got a, a, fel, a fairly detailed application form that is capturing the background of the person, that's capturing where they're, like what their work history has been, their earning capacity over the years, so that they see progression through their career. Um, also, their, I suppose, their net worth, their assets and liabilities, and assist them if they don't know how to calculate that. Um, also, with regards to uh, making sure that they understand how the cash flow of the business works. So when you provide them a, a cash flow that has all the assumptions built into it, they understand the mechanics of the business so that they can go out there, build a worst case scenario and a best case scenario. And then most importantly, how that translates into the business plan. Far too many times have I seen people getting kicked back because the financial information that's in the cash flow is not translated directly into the business plan. There could be a different sales figure in the business plan that's not in the cash flow, and that completely stumps the whole financial application. So it's important that you're, you're capturing that information because it streamlines. Uh, when you've got a really solid candidate, it streamlines the, the, the lending opportunity at, down the track. Well, thank you. Um, and the next thing is around the, the core competencies and capabilities of the potential franchisees. So how do you benchmark, you know, one applicant to another and, you know, ensuring that you've got the best quality candidates coming through to put through to the banks and the franchisor? It's, it's quite funny. I'm, I'm a, like I'm on the phone myself doing recruitment in the business at the moment as well. And it's quite funny because if a person doesn't pick up the phone after three phone calls, how do you think they're going to act as a franchisee? What sort of attitude do they have? Um, if they fill out a business plan with you know, one, one or two words per question, what sort of attention to detail do they have? So when it comes to the, it, you, can, you can have some people who will build out amazing business plans and cash flows and everything like that. But then there's some people who don't know how to do that, but they might have some great personal skills and that's where you have to assist them. So um, realistically, getting back to it, Bruce, you need to understand from the franchisor and within your groups, what is the ideal candidate and what do they do great? Because you're trying to replicate that in the recruitment process when you're discussing it with prospects. So, so tools, you know, what sort of benchmarking, you know, do you assess? Is it um, because obviously lots of systems when they're newer, they're using no benchmarking themselves. So how, yeah. how... So we use like, uh, we use, it is important to get some sort of a tool that actually does measure who your high performers are. So within BDC, we've obviously got the, the rights for a tool called Zoracle Profiling, which basically builds out the psychological DNA of your top performing franchisees. And you can basically then measure uh, prospects uh, against the compatibility to those top performing people. Um, in this day and age with the new code of conduct, cultural alignment is everything when it comes to this new age that we're moving into. So it's very important that we have some form of cultural alignment benchmarking tool in place. And I do suggest that you guys if you want, have a chat with me about the tool that we use here, but make sure that you have something in place uh, uh, that's measuring that sort of capability and compatibility with, with, with your group. I think the banks also are interested in seeing that yeah. there's something in place. And so, you know, there's um, lots of people have used things like the Nathan Profiler and other tools in the marketplace. And yes, so it's just exactly. important that, that things... What, what, what about you, Chris? Do you use uh, any of the tools in your business? Um, I actually was just writing down then um, to, to reach out to David about that. I like the idea of that cultural alignment tool. We don't currently have any, yeah. anything in place in that space. Um, I mean, additionally to, to what's been mentioned, the only real tool like um, that I can think of that's in it, it's sort of just more about canvassing is we use gap maps, yep. which is a really handy, um, I mean, you're probably familiar with it, but it overlays um, a lot of cool visual data from Google Maps, uh, census data, it scrapes white pages and and it, it's just a really good visual way to, um, I guess, look for um, opportunities and, 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 and particularly gaps in, in your market. So when you look when you're yeah. prospecting, it's a really handy tool. Um, but outside of that, really like CRM, uh, we use, I mean, at the moment we use Trello, it's pretty, 
pretty basic and uh, and I actually have an active um, appetite for for more um, because I think it's just there, there's something to be said about just that that more cross collaboration between departments and yeah and, and Trello can be a bit clunky if you it's good for one team but for multiple like cross cross departmental collaboration we are sort of actively looking for sort of a little bit more of a refined CRM um, specifically for, for, for recruitment in mind so um, another thing to add to that, Bruce, is, is that what what, uh, what we find is, is that the, when prospects are coming through and they're seeing that franchisors are actually taking that extra duty of care or due diligence to see that there's cultural alignment between the prospect and the franchisor, it kind of it highlights the intent of the franchisor in maintaining the culture as the business scales. And that's important for the person coming in, because as they say, everything's great in the honeymoon period. But when the pressure really kicks in, are they going to get along? Are they culturally aligned? So when a prospect or when a prospect sees that the franchisor is going to that level of due diligence on a prospect, no longer is it a sales process. It is a granting process to that person who is right. And they feel they feel obliged, they feel comfortable, and they feel they feel engaged moving forward forward after that that point. Yeah, no problem. We might move. Over, we've got lots more on the recruitment side of things, but I'm going to move into induction now um, to you, Tanya. So before you start the recruitment process, you get it. You know, making sure that you've got best practice um, induction program place. So what sort of things do do you recommend that franchisors do or if they have been around for a long time to review their processes? Number one, I would absolutely recommend reviewing. Um, and I, having just come from 7-Eleven, when I first came back after um, seven years away, uh, their training program hadn't actually changed much in the, in the previous seven years, um, which has absolutely changed in the last three to four years. And I think the two, the recruitment and the induction are intrinsically linked because if you've built, uh, if, if you know what good looks like in your recruitment process, that should then absolutely flow into what good looks like in your induction. So you need to know what your touch points are and where your pain points are with your franchisee. So what is it when they first come into the system that, that they struggle with? Um, how, and how do you actually have that built in to make it nice and simple? Now, it, it isn't a case of one size fits all because obviously it's, you know, you look at a, something like a 7-Eleven where it's, you know, 700 to a million plus to get into. The training program there or induction program there is, is at a starting point, eight weeks. You also then look at somewhere, and I'll pick on Kelly because she happens to be on my screen there, but you look at someone like Blue Wheelers, who is it like a $50,000 investment, you're not going to spend eight weeks in training. So you're actually going to have that little bit of courses for courses. But I think it's it's really important to, to be continually reviewing your induction process because if you've got your recruitment right and you know they've got a good culture fit, but maybe they're a little bit weaker on their, on the finance piece, well, then your induction should be fluid enough that you could maybe spend a bit more time with them on that side of the business because every other benchmark that you've got in place for what good looks like they'll tick but equally if they're you know you can't teach culture so you've sort of got to make sure that you have the, the consistency all the way through it otherwise it, it becomes really challenging and also just touching on the question around finance the banks also like to see how you support your franchisees and that initial support is your induction if you're if you have to spend all this time recruiting them and then you go off you go, um, then you're, you're going to trip up at the first hurdle. So, um, so absolutely review it, you know, yearly as a minimum. Um, but, and if you haven't done it for a while, I'd really, I'd step back and, and take a really good look at what your system looks like. We, we did an exercise at 7-Eleven, um, not with any system. We, we, we brought some, some people in to help us with it to um, identify the good, the bad and the indifferent in our business within our franchisees. And we built then a training program around that uh, in, in conjunction with our, our L&D team. But it really did highlight what, um, whether, you know, we, we needed to do more on, on the finance side of business. Not so much about doing P&Ls because in, in this particular instance we did them, but how to read them and how to stop them from defaulting back into cutting costs was the best way to save money as opposed to maybe having an extra person on the floor to drive sales. So it's, it's all of that needs to be built into your induction as you're going through because you set the scene from day one. 
So you think those steps, yeah, depending on the system, can be variable, like from you know three 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 days to three weeks to whatever's yep. appropriate. But there's some key competencies that you want to ensure that the franchisees have got is as part of that process. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And and there, there, there will always be technical skills. Now I'll go back to my Brazilian butterfly days. Um, franchisees needed to know how to wax. Now, you know, um, <laughs> if you can't do that, you really can't be a franchise in that particular industry. Um, so you really do need to make sure that they've got that capability. And a lot of, um, you know, I'm also a great believer in actually putting people in an environment even before they've signed the, the, um, the franchise agreement, particularly when it is, um, you know, they are, if, if they are the face of the business and they are the ones that are going to be representing your brand, you need to, you need to include as part of your recruitment slash early piece around, so how do they interact with customers? You know, are they, you know, do they like dealing with people? Do they like dealing with animals? Are they comfortable with the tools that are required for your particular business? Because you, as I said, you can teach the basics around most business skill sets. What you can't teach is a, is a, is, is a belief or a, a passion in whatever the brand is going to be. You know, I, I often tell a story when I was with Gloria Jean's Coffees where we had someone that wanted, was adamant they were going to buy this business. They, the word they used to me was they actually hated the taste and smell of coffee. <laughs> now, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I was also the training manager at Gloria Jean's. I would have found that really difficult to train that person because <laughs> how do they test how do they actually um, understand whether the product's good or not? Now, I know that's quite an extreme way and that particularly um, goes through the process, but, you know, those are the sort of things that, that you need to pick up on it. And, you know, we've all had trainers come to you at halfway through a training program and say, so why did we choose this franchisee again? Um, so I think if you can, can you know, combine both induction and recruitment into one, you can often say, save yourself a bit of pain. What about, so Alan or Chris Caldwell within the fitness industry, obviously that's important as well. So how do you build into the, the into that initial training program? You know, what sort of timeframes and skills do you ensure, insist on? Uh, I'll jump in first if you want to. Um, uh, our, our training programs are nowhere near comprehensive enough at the moment um, for what they should be. And, uh, you know, we, we do have a lot of, um, pre-qualified people come in, but, but they're either qualified in a, in a, in a personal training or a, a physical education type. Do you want to talk, sorry to interrupt, your brands, just so everyone on the call? Yeah. Uh, so Snap Fitness is our is probably our, our most well-known brand, which is the logo up the top. And I know Ernst has already told me I've got to change these and I'm getting around to it. Uh, <laughs> nine Round nine round is a boxing, uh, kickboxing yeah. Uh, yeah. gym that we've got across Australia New Zealand. And then... Um, not to steal Alan Sunder, but we're, we're now um, a, a decent shareholder in, in Fitstop as well. Um, but if I, can I just go back to the recruitment side of things, um, Bruce? So um, in my experience, the minute you think you've got your recruitment right, uh, you're behind um, because it's constantly, you've got to constantly change it. Now, you know, it's a, it's a dog-eat-dog sales type environment. The minute you do something that works, 40 other people will be copying it. So you've got to be constantly on the go and constantly on the move changing. I mean, it's a, it's a pure sales, you know, it's a really is a sales process. And, you know, if you think about, you know, the sale, the sales manager's got to put food on the table to eat. And it's, it's like a, like a, like a bird scratching around getting worms. If it can't find one, it doesn't stop looking. It just goes and looks somewhere else. So, um, and then in terms of our, uh, I guess our cultural alignment, um, we have a particular question um, in our application and it's a picture of Michael Lerma. And um, if they swipe left, <laughs> They go out, and if they swipe right, they're, they're constantly in line for us. <laughs> so, so we, we have them come into our into our funnel. But um, I'm only joking. I can say that because I respect him greatly in the in the, in the franchise space. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and, and but our training programs, you know, they're they're nowhere near comprehensive enough for you know someone buying a seven seven or eight hundred thousand dollar greenfield site. Um, literally has a, a couple of weeks uh, training in a in a club. Uh, and then one week in in our business in our head office um, going through their training. We do then have a you know a, a level of hand holding and support throughout, but it's still not where I want it to be. Um, so we've got a bit of work to do there. What about you, Alan? Yeah, we're, we're probably a little bit similar as well. So you know we're probably a younger business than say some of the others which are on the call as well. But 
you know, induction itself is a, it's a one week onboarding, which is everything around operational and, you know, managing the business versus also product, which is our programming component and so forth as well. We do like to say buddy up our business owners as well for that following week post the induction with depending on what state they're in as well. So linking them into high performance operators, getting them to do shadow shifts with them, um, with those business owners, but then also understanding from a, more of a relationship piece as well, the pain points of what that experience has been as well and how do we minimise as much of that as, um, as they come through that process as well. And you know, probably similar to say what Chris said as, as, as well, like a, a lot for us around the cultural alignment, you know, we're very stringent on that operational approval process. So, you know, not only from the sales team, but also from the, you know, the frontline support team as well. And then, you know, it comes through either myself as COO or CEO for, you know, operational approval as well. But I think we can get better at, uh, yeah, linking in more of a benchmarking tool to support that as well. Cool. Thank you. And so, Tanya, what about ongoing training? Once, you know, they've got through the induction process, you know, how do you, how, you know, how often do you recommend or what sort of you recommend there? Well, I, and I suppose this also then comes back to what the Chris and Ellen were just talking about it is is how detailed your um, actual induction program is. So, you know, uh, but for me, um, it's in the, that the first year is your critical year. So you've, you've, you've recruited them well, you've put them through the induction, they're up and running, but you can't wait till the end of the year to review how they've been performing through the year. So if as part of the recruitment, if they've, submitted business plans which I'm assuming they have profit and loss statements all of that as a minimum quarterly you should be sitting down with them and saying all right how are we going so if we're actually uh, are we meeting what we said we were going to said we were going to meet how's your cash flow going how are all the all the, the key benchmarks in your system being met and if they're being met great so how do we continue to improve on that but if they're not why not where are the parts that we're missing? Because you as the franchisor will learn just as much about whether it's the franchisee or there's things you've been missing as much as where the franchisee will do. But it needs to be structured and it needs to be out of the business would be my advice. Now, it can still be held at your place of business, but it, it can't be on the floor. So it can't be in the middle of a training session or it can't be in the middle of serving customers or whatever it's going to be. It needs to be a dedicated allocated in the diary time that will actually work through how they're performing because you can you can steer a ship a lot easier once if you know straight up as, as opposed to coming waiting six months later and then going oh hang on a minute the first six months didn't go anywhere near what I thought and all that other work that you've done isn't actually working from there so so we've I found we've I implemented that was implemented through Gloria Jeans, but we're not Gloria Jeans, sorry, 7-Eleven, but we've also, I've also seen it work with much smaller businesses and it's worked really well because A, it's that touch point again, but equally it's actually hitting any problems before they get too big. Because the yep. last, you know, one of the biggest challenges you have in that first six months is your cash flow. If, you, if you're not, you know, a business is good, but I'm not making money, why not? Or if business is bad, all of those things. Um, I think the ongoing training platform is is absolutely critical and it can't be it needs to be all, all linked in so you know if, whether it's an excel spreadsheet that talks to another i think we're hopefully getting a little bit past that now but it has to be built into your system whether yep. it is your on-field support staff whoever's doing it that they actually um are responsible and accountable and reporting back on it yeah we're going to get into the the benchmarking systems a little bit in a second with aaron but just one more question for you before we move to that Sure. What about you do find that person who doesn't like coffee that's just bought a coffee franchise and they've somehow got through the recruitment process and how do you manage the, and you know, that decision where you, you know, the business and particularly smaller biz, smaller franchise systems that, you know, they, the revenue they get from the, the sale of the new franchise is important. And then to say, look, you haven't quite made it through this uh, initial training or initial induction program. How do you manage that? Um, uh, <laughs> To be honest with you, you've really got to be brutal. And I know that's really easy for me to sit here, but I, I have actually had it happen Not um, where the, the person lasted six weeks and we had an eight-week program and it was Gloria Jeans. It wasn't the same person because they never actually got into training. Um, but they just, they just actually couldn't cope with the day-to-day business of it and they were going to lose money. And, and I think you've got to take it as much from yeah, this is another one. as yours. And far I have like an opportunity. Oh. Sorry, oh, oh, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah. So, Nikita, so if you can turn them off. Sorry, Nikita. <laughs> no 
that's okay. So I think you've got to, but that's also part of your induction. Like yeah. there should, depending on how you do it. So if it's a combination of practical and theory, and so you might have someone in the, in a in your uh, offices for a week and other people out on the out on the road or in one of your scores the two need to be talking to one another so you need to have whoever's in charge of your training or induction actually you know every week having some form of informal or formal report that says these guys are on track or gee they're really struggling on this one we need to sit with them and tell them so the, a little bit like those fantastic performance reviews we all love to do there shouldn't be any surprises as we go through a training as to how your how your incoming franchisees are performing if they're performing great you tell them but if they're not performing well then you also need to be saying guys there these are some um some critical steps here you know we've had people not turn up for training you know we're, we're rostered to be in store and didn't turn up now again you if you don't address it at the time you are accepting a behaviour that's going to happen in your stores because, yes, there's always exceptions to rules and there's things that happen. <laughs> the last two years has shown us that. No, nothing else will. But just not showing up and not doing anything is, is, is lots of... There are lots of red flags that you need to avoid. And, yes, understand as you're growing, the last thing you want to do is say, gee, I'm going to lose that sale. But I can tell you the heart, the pain that you'll have in the next you know, 12 months to two or three years as you're trying to manage this person out of your system, uh, a short-term pain is way, more, way more worth it than trying to, to just make them right because if they're not right, they're not. Yeah, no, and no, I know no, that's important. So, Michael, what about you at, uh, at Boost and, you know, that early induction program, how are you managing it? It was fascinating listening to Tanya and I couldn't agree more. Um, however, I would suggest that, once a new partner has come in and signed an agreement, a franchise agreement, and you've banked that sale and using all that terminology, and you think it's there, and you and we all hope that our recruitment process is really spot on, we nail everyone right. So you hope that there's no one that you need to terminate before they even, because our, our franchise agreements are contingent on successful completion of training. However, yeah, which it should be. That should be just a given, yeah. Uh, yeah, but there's probably a number of people that, that have come through training and made it through training that probably shouldn't have. And th those signs come up in training. And I, and I can think of, we've probably done it maybe three times, but we mothballed the whole store for a year and it was cheaper paying some rent than dealing with that partner for the term of the franchise agreement, the pain that they would have given us. And, and still, it was the right decision but far too often we all make a commercial decision and go, we, or whoever made that commercial decision or says, <laughs> no, no, let's just continue with it. So there, there are times when it comes out in training and you, you see it in training. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things we get through the induction training, our, our training team give us a, a one or two page report, a really good report on to the ops team, to everyone. The, this is what I've found through the training. These are their strong points. These are the bits they need to work on, et cetera. And it's really good. And, but very rarely does someone not make it through training, but there should probably be a bit more of that. Yeah. Sorry, that's what I just wanted to add, Bruce. Yeah, no, no, and, no. I think, and I think that's your point. Like the reality is there's no such thing as a foolproof recruiting, but the more you do it and the more science you have around it, whether it be using all the different tools out there, you are certainly narrowing your chances down. But let's be honest, everyone's on their best behaviour when they're doing interviews. Yeah. Like we all are. We always, you know, but... If you're in a if you're in training and you're dealing with customers or you're dealing with situations that you're not used to, that's often when things come out that may have may have got missed. It's it's not as as um, probably prevalent as it was even ten years ago because I think most people are really quite the culture piece is a lot stronger than it used to be, or the need for that is a lot stronger than it used to be, as opposed to oh, they've got a basic skill set, they've got a bit of money, um, we we think we can train them. Yeah. But you do have to make those hard calls every now and then and, and every one of us will have had or will come across it where it's had to be. And yeah. when we haven't done it, it, it's hurt. Yeah. We might keep going, Tanya, just to move Sorry. through. Yeah, We've yeah. got to induction. They've got through and now it's so... Just, so, Bruce, uh, Bruce, just quickly, Chris Chris put in a comment there. Just do, do you share that two-pager with the candidate? My My advice on that is that it should be shared so that the candidate knows what they need to work on. Yeah. Um, and if you see that the candidate actually goes and physically works on that, that's an attitude trait that you can't you can't train in itself. 
But if the candidate goes and hides from that, then you know you're in trouble. Yeah, without a doubt. Sorry, Bruce. No, no, no problem at all. Um, yeah. Yeah, we, our, our challenge for this session is we're covering four very important parts of the system, but we're, we're going to look at benchmarking in a little bit more detail now. So, Aaron, what sort of financial information do you recommend um, that franchisors are, are looking at regularly? And yeah, perfect. So I, I think the most, in the most basic sort of sense, what do you want to be getting off each of the franchisees is sort of regular reporting. Um, and I, I just recognise there's lots of different systems out there that go about this in uh, different ways. Some have big operating systems, which cover uh, operating programs, which cover the whole systems and a lot of reporting is done internally. Uh, and probably on the other end of the scale, uh, there's some systems out there who uh, kind of just let the franchisees go and then ask them to report back in some method. But the key is to get uh, regular reporting uh, from your franchisees coming in. And to do that, you've got to get it, you know, as simple as it is, systematic as possible. Now, for those people who, who aren't on these big operating systems, some of, the, some of the keys to getting this to work is probably make sure everybody's on, as best you can be, the same software platform. So, for example, try not to have some on spreadsheets, some on mild, some on um, zero. It's much easier if we can just get them all on the same software and have them coming out. Try to make sure that they've got, uh, they can either do bookkeeping themselves or they're using a good bookkeeper because the idea about getting monthly reports out, if they don't have an external bookkeeper, it's just going to be a bunch of garbage. And so then when it comes time to do your um, benchmarking and so forth, the whole process kind of won't work. Another, another key for it all is to get the chart of accounts aligned. And so each franchisee should have the same chart of accounts. Again, it's going to give you that comparable data. And we're chatting just before, you can structure it in a, in a, in a point where, um, you know, People may or may not do it, have sort of non-operating or non-core expenses running through. You can set that up so it's, you know, allocated to separate sections of the profit and loss. So it doesn't noisy up the data. So you've got really good comparable stuff running through there. And so um, you can set it up so that when it does come, come time to sell, uh, you know, there's not these surprise ad backs that uh, franchisees don't understand. And they've always seen their true operating profit along as they go. And so that's probably around a monthly reporting process. And, you know, outside of that, there's some other ways you can do uh, subject to your access and how you set up. You might be able to get some more real-time data uh, from some of the sites, POS machines and, and have a look in, in, in there and what they're doing. You may have access to some of their, their ordering traits and, and stock and, and so forth. And also uh, you, you, you may have a bigger operating system that will allow you to access sort of more live data and have a look in their key KPIs. So what sort of like software reporting software do you, you see in systems that, that are effective? Yeah, so what we see, there's a whole there's a whole range that are out there. So sort of the reach reporting, Sage, Oracle, um, NetSuite, um, and then of course, you know, the bespoke franchise operating systems. What we're seeing is, you know, a really good combo at the moment is um, both Zero, then combined with the program Spotlight Multi. Um, so Zero is great. It's the easiest accounting software to use. It's cloud-based. It's simple. And then you can have uh, this aggregator called Spotlight Multi, which can grab all of your sites and sort of line them up next to each other. So you can have, you know, up to, you know, 40, 50, 60 sites all compared against each other. Uh, and the good thing is you can set it up uh, so it can either display who all the sites are and you can name all the sites. So you can show everybody, you know, here's the top 10 sales by name, or you can, you know, flick one of the settings and have it uh, amortized. No, that's not the right word. Uh, you can take all the names off it. And so you can't actually see who those people are. However, each person will get a report just showing where they rank. So for example, you know, it's just a bit of a softer way uh, of putting that data out there. So, you know, if you're ranking, you know, 20 out of um, yeah, 30 businesses, it's just not as sort of confronting. So yeah, I think Spotlight combined with Zero and the, and the key benefits, super easy to use uh, and then can aggregate the data up. And Spotlight, it's good. Uh, it, 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 it produces data in an easy to read way, lots of pie charts and graphs and things like that. So you're not staring at pages of numbers because you know, I think I think everybody, even me as an accountant, finds it pretty painful when you just get a huge page of numbers and <laughs> someone tells you work out how you're going. 
So yeah, yeah, something yeah. like Power BI, mate, it, is that something that you've... Yeah, Power BI is, is also a great one because Power BI is, again, it's another data aggregator. So it can pull information out of different systems. So for example, it can pull information out of your POS, it can pull out information out of your HR software, say Deputy, uh, and also you might be using something like Deer or an inventory software. And you can have all of that uh, data suck in and, and build a, a series of dashboards or, or, or just, you know, uh, these dashboards, which again, are super simple uh, to, 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 re to see what's going on in the data. Yeah. What about Pete, you at Ferguson Play, you've got some great data that you're comparing your franchisees with? Uh, yeah, well, we're just introducing uh, uh, Arcadia, is it? I think I'm not that okay with it, but uh, it's been rolled out for all the new stores. Yeah. Uh, with blending that in with zero as well. So good to hear some uh, positives about zero. Um, the idea, of course, is to try and eliminate as much admin work as our great retailers uh, generally don't do, tend to be great uh, administrators. So yeah, once we get some uh, solid data, then we can you know, really feed back into the, the system and specifically to the franchisees some really good feedback on where they are going well and where they're not going so well. So yeah, it's got to be a full circle. The data's got to be uh, true and uh, consistent coming out of the franchisees, but we've got to react to it and go back into the source of it. Yeah. Um, and so, Aaron, what about, you know, when you're finding trends that are showing that the franchisees aren't going so well, you are, what are you doing there? Yeah, and so that's a great thing. Um, when we when you think about franchising businesses compared to other businesses, the best thing is that you can get all of your um, your KPI data, and you can get data you know that you compare against uh, all the businesses in the, in the network. So you can um, get some really strong data about you know what's your top ten percent, um, what are they achieving in terms of sales, and then you can structure your profit and loss so that uh, you know you can see. You know, what is the cost of goods sold percentage of sales, employees as a percentage of sales, and then you go even some more, you know, uh, into the niche sites, you know, what's rent as a percentage of sales? So when you're looking at going into your lease, you're saying, well, is this actually going to work? If, if, if the whole network's running at 12% rent costs and this one's at 18, how is that going to work? So you can start to use those, you know, KPIs and ratios to, you know, just make sure sites are going to work. And then once you've got this data, uh, you've probably found out by other ways, but you might have sites that aren't performing in the way that you'd like. And so when, once you've got this data, what you're able to do is build up a knowledge bank of um, uh, strategies and concepts that you know, your top performers are putting in place to achieve these results. And so um, I think the, the group that I've seen do this the, the best is Mazda. Mazda run um, quarterly meetings where they get all of their dealers in the room uh, and they'll put uh, the top 10 uh, performance in terms of sales and they'll, and they'll get people to present. They'll just throw it on and go, mate, how did you achieve the sales this month? And so you can get this great knowledge to spread throughout the network. And again, you can use those strategies to build up you know, a, a wealth of knowledge at head office so then when you do have underperforming sites, you can say, all right, cool. We've looked at your data and it looks like you've got, you're underperforming, your sales are going well, but we can see through your ratios, you've got issues with wages. And then you can go to, you know, from, from your experience, who's doing really well with wages? Have they got a whole bunch of part-timers doing a heap of overtime and triggering those really expensive reward wages? Or, you know, that's just an example. So once you've got the data and, and the, the knowledge of how to treat these issues, you'll be able to bring solutions to the, the underperformers. And I think Correct. it's one of the one of the other bits, sorry, Bruce, on it is creating a culture of, you know, we're all in this together and, and helping and improving rather than uh, a culture of whacking people with a stick. And uh, if you're not performing, there's no point going down and telling them that not performing, they're, they're probably aware of it. Uh, and, you know, everybody's in these uh, sites to make some money and they're probably not feeling great about it uh, going poorly already. So if you can create that culture of, you know, we're in this together and nurturing and, and, and training, I think you've got a much better chance of sort of turning it around uh, and, you know, bringing them back up to, to being a good performer. Yeah, if you get the, it's a culture of compliance as well, isn't it? To ensure that if they're doing all the right things, we can, if they're not doing all those things, it's hard to, to help them and to help them improve. So Cam, oh, Cam's disappearing. I'm just about to ask him a question. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> sit back down, mate. You're on stage. <laughs> like too late. So you know we've we've worked through. We've got the franchisee into the system. We've you know we've managed their induction and their performance on the way through. But now it's time to leave. And so this is not a legal thing. I'm not trying to breach them and terminate their agreement. They've been a great performer because we've managed them on the way through. So what should the franchisor do to assist the franchisees when they're thinking about selling their business? Sorry about my little boy in the background. If you can all hear that, he's not very happy. So that's why I was ducking out. But <laughs> look, guys, um, the, the key is, is like Aaron said, is just making sure you've got all the data and it's being prepared in a way that the franchisee or the partner is, is has got the true and correct data. There's so many times that we've seen reports um, that we, we know there's, there's some issues with it. We know we have to go in and, and do further due diligence on just getting the numbers before um, you know, you put this to, to market and that might be out to the broader market or within your, your network. So the, the most important thing is just making sure you've got it in your process to collate all the appropriate due diligence, have a checklist for your, your franchisees that they can follow and make sure all that is, is, is set and ready to go. Um, your, obviously your financials, your lease agreements, your assets, your staffing, all this stuff is really important and should be very easily picked up by a, um, you know, by a franchisee to, to present. Um, the other thing that's really important is, is not forgetting that when somebody is coming into the system, that they should have some understanding of how they're gonna exit that system. You know, it, it hopefully is not, you know, quickly and, and for, for poor reasons, but hopefully they've got a great ROI on their initial investment. And then that's a positive story that they're putting out to the market. So don't treat it as um, always doom and gloom when someone's looking to exit but an opportunity to, to push a greater ROI for that, that person as well. Um, so Cam, you've got them already, you know, the franchisors assisted the franchisees to ensure that they're, they're sale ready, which is really important. So, you know, all their, their accounts are in order. Um, you know, their, their, uh, every, all their documents, obviously, is their franchise documents will be in order, but there are other things that they've got are in order. What about then? So the, you know, the, the franchisees wanting to sell and they're, the franchisor thinks maybe there's people within their own network that want to buy. Like how, you know, how does that process normally work? Yeah, look, it's all about collaboration and communication with, with this. Okay. You've got somebody that's, uh, you know, wanting to move on for one reason or another, it could be a multitude of things and they've got to see that you're actively, pro, you know, actively helping them to, to do that. Um, we obviously are a service that is arms, arm's length that can help that. But internally, just getting it out to the network in either a confidential way or with their permission, letting them know the, the location that's up for sale and, and having certain steps like a confidentiality deed for, for people to sign. So they see that you've got sort of that, that, real, um, that real effort to, to move them on when they've chosen to, to do so and, and not sort of holding them in just because they've been a great great, great partner with you. So often we see that using an arm's length um, service like ours helps and, and gives us that sort of rounded, um, you know, rounded point of view of, of helping people within the network buy or somebody outside the network come in. And it allows, um, you know, that arm's length where the franchisor doesn't feel like they're going to have to say no to certain people. And it's really the, the broker or our service that puts up only those that are qualified. So internally, you might be able to find people. Externally, you might be able to find people. But each person is, is taken at their value and, and hopefully, you know, a smooth transition if they're, they're, they're qualified correctly. Yeah, no worries. And that's that collaboration piece you talk about, because I know, you know, you as the broker, one of the worst things is when you've got to go back and get approval for a potential buyer and the franchisor is not kind of across the process to, to, to the degree that they probably should be, you know, and then that slows your job down and makes your life difficult. So what sort of recommendations do you have for franchisors as part of that approval process? Yeah, certainly. So look, with, with everything, there should be a confidentiality deed signed initially. Um, that would give you a certain level of, of due diligence provided to that purchaser um, through a business profile or a memorandum of information. 
The next step that we do is an expression of interest. So that expression of interest should be asking sort of the questions to qualify that, that purchaser, okay? So what is their business history? What have they got financially in regards to, to capacity to buy the business? Um, we often ask for a small deposit. Um, it's totally refundable, but a bona fide payment that they're, they're, they're ready to, to buy a business and they've, they've got a commitment towards um, taking some time up with the, the, the franchisee that's exiting, but also with the franchisor and also complete some form of application form that the franchise all provides us. So it's really important that we're not wasting anybody's time with this. We wanna do as much qualifying with them as we can, not only get approval from, from you guys as the franchise all, but also the banks, okay? Are they gonna get financed? And also the landlords, are they gonna be approved from the landlords? So um, any broker or anybody in your, your organization working on these resales or these exits, they need to ensure that they're, you know, they're not wasting anybody's time and that, that qualifying is done pretty early in the piece um, for, for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, mate. And then, then I guess we're sort of winding back to the start where we were talking about with um, recruiting greenfield sites with Dave, but talking about marketing existing businesses and how you're finding that, you know, where, where are your best leads coming from when you're trying to sell businesses at the moment? Yeah, look, it's it's always a, a hard one to do for us because you do have a number of different um, models or a number of different franchisors we're working with and um, where you field for those potential franchisees is going to be completely different from case from case. So obviously there's all the third party websites. Um, some are better than others. Some will just provide you um, tire kickers and, and a lot of them. So making sure that you you do a, a, smart, a smart assessment of, of where your best clients are coming from. We do a lot of social media as well. And then making sure you can efficiently, efficiently get through um, those leads every lead is touched on, every lead is, is called back and, and spoken with, but then always knowing what will get through and won't get through the franchise or progress. Um, so when they come in, give them the confidentiality deed. If they don't sign that, they don't, you know, they don't really want to look at buying a business, so move them on quickly. So third-party websites, the social media, and then networking, networking within the industry, um, at, at events, at anything to do with, with that, that particular brand um, or industry is, is where we're finding a lot of our leads. Yeah. And how are you finding uh, getting, once you've got them, getting them through finance and getting them the transactions done, is, it, is COVID impacting on that at all? It is. Look, there's certainly a, an issue at the moment, in particular industries, finance is, is hard to obtain. But look, if they've got a good track record as a business, it's great. Um, if they've got equity in their homes or other assets, cash, you know, that always helps. Um, more and more days today, we're seeing vendor finance terms as well. So um, there can be a lot of, lot of times where there's somebody been in a long established business for, for many, many years. They've got a great understanding of the business. They're moving on due to retirement or they've just had enough of, of working and they've got another opportunity they need to follow. But they've got trust within that business. They know how that business can, can continue to grow or, or continue to, to perform well. So they're happy to do a level of vendor finance that really moves forward with um, uh, the, the ability of that purchaser to pay an optimal price for that business. Um, and, and that's what we're seeing as, as probably a little bit more of a case now with um, some of those smaller transactions. Yeah, cool. Well, I'm, we've only got a couple of minutes left. I'm going to loop back to a question that Rob asked for you, either um, Aaron or Dave, to answer that around access to files. But he asked, you know, with, in the chat, for the benchmarking, do you have access to the zero files um, and whether or not that's the case? From the legal side of things, often uh, it's not in franchise agreements. Um, so you normally can't dive into that much detail. But yeah, it's, it's some of the benchmarking tools do require that, don't Aaron? Is that right? Yeah, that's right. They, they work best if they um, can sync through to the zero files um, or if they're, if they're reporting back to you um subject to how they're reporting back to you, you can you use that data to to flow through into the tools as well yep more, more than likely also if you've got the if you've got the correct benchmarking in place with your system 
and you have a strong understanding of what the top line sales are for that system, you can actually reverse engineer what they should be doing and you can very quickly pick up uh, problems. But to try and get access to people zero, if you don't create that culture from the start, it's quite difficult. Yeah. You have to build the trust. You have to build it, it, it. More than likely, you have to show them benefit of them of you seeing it, and then they'll gently, they'll eventually start giving access to it. And that was pretty much where I was going to jump in as well. Um, and I see Nick's on the call, but when we I worked with the Sigma, which is our pharmacy chains, um, getting information in the early days was really tough because they they just didn't trust. And that was that was as blunt as it was. But once we started showing what they could do with the information, then it gradually changed. It took a couple of years, don't get me wrong. It wasn't something that happened overnight. But once we started to actually demonstrate the value in providing the information and how it was being used, it became a lot easier. And then we also, when we updated our franchise agreements, we put it into the franchise agreement that they would also provide it to. So we went from, you know, we worked with them to get the trust piece, but then any time a new franchisee came in or a, uh, a franchise agreement was renewed, it was in their franchise agreement. So we were then able to enforce it. So um, but it depends on where you're at in your franchise cycle as to where, where your franchise agreement's at there, yeah. Thank you, Tanya. I'm one minute over. And uh, thank you, everyone, for participating today. So thank you for joining. Um, for those of you who weren't able to um, join that are watching this later on, if you've got any questions about any of the content, feel, feel free to contact any of us. Thank you to Tanya, to Aaron, to David, and to Cam, our presenters today. So great job. Round of applause for you guys. And uh, everyone, stay safe, stay strong. We'll get through this uh, <laughs> Lovely time of lockdown, and um, but get to run our businesses <laughs> and get to go and play golf again too, Michael. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. See you later. See ya. Thank you. Bye.